Hello, everybody. Happy Thursday. How was it already Thursday? I, you all know I have like this weird relationship with time. I feel like, and this is, you know, this is, I feel like something like my parents would say, like the older I get, the faster time flies, but it's true. Like, how is it already Thursday? I swear sometimes I, cause you know, I prepare for the show the day prior and I'm reminded like yesterday I looked at it, I'm like, oh my God, I'm doing the rundown for Thursday. It's just, it's crazy. Um, but I guess that's what happens when you're having fun. Yeah. Um, okay, everybody. Um, we have got a bombshell of a story to get to today. Um, this is a story that you will pretty much only find in true depth on OutKick. Uh, it's a story that was broken originally by one of our very own writers, Dan Jakszewski. And Dan Z has been all over the story and continues to be. And that's why there is now also a recent break in this story. Uh, you can check out his most recent article. It's now up on OutKick.com, but I'm going to run through the details for you. And then um, we've got a guest to come in and help to break it down even further. So obviously, as you know, we've been covering this story now uh, at this rate for, I would say, close to eight weeks at this point. Um, there is the volleyball team at San Jose State University, right? They have a transgender player on their team. That transgender's name is Blair Fleming, right? We had Brooke Slusser, one of the co-captains of that team. She is, in fact, a biological woman. She came on the show to talk to me about what was going on with her team at this point over a month ago. Um, she actually came forward um, very aggressively and was speaking out about the fact that they had a transgender player on their team and how it wasn't fair treatment to the rest of the players, how they felt uncomfortable, uh, how they didn't feel that they had the ability to really speak up without fear of repercussion. That has indeed proved to be the case because even one of the assistant coaches on that team who was very much an advocate for these women who felt so uncomfortable, she has now been suspended. Brooke Slusser, the co-captain, has joined in the lawsuit being filed against the NCAA uh, because of its attempts to not uphold the true protections of Title IX, which we know there have been issues with that with our current administration as well. Um, okay, so the team at San Jose State University, they have not only been getting support from their own at the university, but also from their entire conference. So now, here is what is the newest development in the story with San Jose State University women's volleyball team. A dozen women, including Brooke Slusser, who I recall, has been on this show. Uh, also two former SJSU Spartans, along with athletes from four other Mountain West schools. That's the conference that they're in. Uh, these schools being those that forfeited matches versus SJSU because of Brooke Fleming, that's the trans player. Uh, these women, a dozen of them, have filed a lawsuit against the Mountain West Conference and its commissioner, along with some of the officials at San Jose State University. Now, this lawsuit alleged violations of Title IX and the First Amendment rights of these female athletes, resulting, of course, from the presence of transgender player Blair Fleming and also the adaptation or the adoption, rather, of a new transgender participation policy that was instituted in what these women who have filed the lawsuit call an effort to, quote, chill and suppress the free speech rights of women athletes. So more details of this filing, what they reveal is that the Mountain West adapted or adopted, I keep saying adapted, I mean adopted, adopted this new transgender participation policy. They put this into place, listen to this, on the same day in September that Boise State became the first team in the conference to forfeit its match versus SJSU. The reason they forfeited, obviously, they weren't comfortable playing on a team that had a biological man present. Right, so immediately, the Mountain West Conference put in place this transgender participation policy, basically saying that it's all good for them to have a trans player on the team, right? This wasn't something that players or teams should be able to speak out about this, because according to the conference, it's totally kosher, right? The suit alleges that the conference's commissioner, Gloria Navarez, believed that the, quote, burgeoning controversy around Fleming, which we knew to be the case, a lot of people had an issue with it, could lead to multiple teams to protest like Boise State. And that's why the new policy was put into place. 
obviously. Gloria Navarez was absolutely spot on in her belief that this would lead to multiple teams protesting because it absolutely did. Boise State was the first and several other teams followed suit. That included Wyoming, Nevada and Utah State, with actually Wyoming and Boise State forfeiting two matches each. Now, here's what we know about athletics, right? I can tell you this from my days as an athlete. It's very much just the rule across the board. When a team forfeits, that team loses, and it equates to a win for the team that, you know, had suffered the other team forfeiting. So what does this mean? This means that SJSU now has a slew of games. Um, if we look at one, two, three, four, five, s at least six games that I, you know, if I'm doing my math properly, that they now have wins marked in, you know, that, that column for them, um, rather than them just being canceled out because the game was never really played. So the conference standings obviously would be skewed in SJSU's favor as a result of all these forfeitures, which were as a result of them having a trans player on the team that obviously a lot of people were very uncomfortable with, even those playing with Blair Fleming on the SJSU women's volleyball team. Now, the volleyball players claim in the suit that the match is forfeited because of Fleming shouldn't count as losses because the women were simply exercising their First Amendment rights and this newly enacted transgender participation policy should not have been passed in the first place. So the lawsuit, here's what it's aiming to do. It's seeking an injunction, asking the conference to either disqualify San Jose State from competing in the conference tournament, which is upcoming uh, later this month in Las Vegas. Another option would be to disqualify just Blair Fleming from competing in the conference tournament and or remove the losses from the records of team who protested by not playing their games against SJSU. And then that would subsequently obviously remove the wins from SJSU. And then the conference standings would be completely different. They will look completely different. If the judge does in fact go in this direction, you can imagine the conference tournament, the games that are played, the rankings are going to be severely impacted. So, San Jose State, for example, if this does in fact prove to be the case, because obviously there's there's some options here, right? You disqualify SJSU, you disqualify solely Blair Fleming, or you remove the losses from the records of the team, remove the wins from SJSU as a result of this forfeitures. Now, if they do just change the standings and go with that third option, uh, San Jose State will fall from second place in the conference to sixth place, right? the winner of that tournament automatically receives a bid into the NCAA tournament. So this is not, you know, small peanuts that we're talking about. This is a massive deal um, that, you know, every team wants to have their own fair ability to compete, uh, their own fair ability to win, and to understand that just because you spoke out about something and then that impacts your ability to potentially move ahead into a conference tournament, move ahead in the conference tournament, then move ahead in the, the national tournament, um, that would be very upsetting for me. Uh, I don't know what is going to happen. I hope, listen, I hope a couple things happen. I hope that the injunction serves to remove the wins and losses that shouldn't be there in the first place because I do think that the standings right now are skewed in the way that benefits SJSU, which, you know, and not only just benefits SJSU, but specifically benefits the trans player on that team. Because as we've even mentioned, uh, Brooks Lesser being one, um, several other former teammates uh, who have come forward in this specific lawsuit. And, and Brooke even mentioned there was a lot of women on her team who would, you know, didn't want to come out publicly, but felt uncomfortable with having a trans player on the team. This doesn't just affect teams opposing them. This affects them as well. So even going into the conference tournament, I bet they would feel, I mean, yes, it would change their game plan. Uh, they would definitely have to shuffle things around a bit. Um, but I, I have a feeling they would feel more comfortable also going into that tournament, knowing it's just biological women on their team and also knowing that their opponents respect them as well, because you have to imagine every team that they go up to play, even the teams that don't forfeit, look at them with a little bit of disgust because they already know that they're not, it's not an equal playing field. And that can't feel good for the players that deserve to be there on the SJSU women's team as well. So here's what I hope happens. One, I hope that the, the judge decides to, you know, figure out the standings, um, make it 
look like it would have if these forfeitures would not have resulted in losses for opposing teams. Um, secondly, I do hope that they prevent Blair Fleming from competing in the conference tournament. I don't want them to disqualify SJSU. That would just be... That would be horrible for these women who really have no control, right? This is not up to SJSU. This is not up to the women who have been brave enough to speak up against the trans player on their team, like Brooks Lesser. Um, they obviously, their feelings are not valid for people to pay any attention to. Uh, the feelings of one biological man on that team are worth more than all of the women's feelings on this team that has been proven to be the case throughout the duration of this season. And it would be a real shame if these women didn't have the ability to compete. So I just want the judge to remove Blair Fleming. I think she should not be allowed to compete any longer. I think that the standings need to change. And then you see from there what it looks like, because wouldn't it be something? Wouldn't it be incredible? Now, listen, I want to give a fair shake to any team in that conference. Um, but wouldn't it be incredible if SJSU went into this tournament without Blair Fleming, with solely the female athletes on that team that deserve the right to be there, even, even having fallen to sixth place from second, because that's what's ultimately going to happen if the losses and wins are reversed, and they still go on to win their bid to the NCAA tournament, wouldn't that, I mean, that would be a real story. That would be a movie potentially in the making. Obviously, for all of these women, whether it's the Spartans, whether it's another team in their conference, whether it's another team in another conference who's looking at this situation with like eyes wide open, thinking, thank goodness I'm not playing for one of those schools. Maybe there's a woman in another conference who, I don't know, at one point was considering going to a school in this specific Mountain West conference. And they're thinking, thank goodness I didn't make that decision. How my life, my athletic career would have been changed. Um, this is really setting a precedent, I believe, um, at this juncture. Uh, I, I believe that this lawsuit is, however it shakes out, is really going to set the tone um, for how female athletes are regarded in this country. Because this shouldn't have happened in the first place. These women have been working so hard to get to this point. To get to the college level in any sport takes tremendous, not just talent, but dedication. Uh, I never got to that point. Um, then again, I was a 5'2 high schooler attempting to be a volleyball player. I mean, that's just should have played a different sport. Mom, dad, please should have pushed me in another direction. Um, but, but still, you know, it, if I really wanted it to happen, and maybe I could have gone to a D3 school, potentially. You don't know. Um, and it takes a lot of work, though. And I also looked at, you know, even in college, you have to sacrifice a lot to be a student athlete. Because not only do you have your grades to worry about, you have practices, sometimes multiple times a day. You have conditioning workouts. You have games that take you away from your school, your social scene during the week, on the weekends. Like, you live, breathe, and sleep excuse me, school and your sport. So for these women that have given up their lives, given up so much to be in the position they're in, to now be confronted with, you know, maybe we don't even get to play in our conference tournament because based on not our decision, we have a trans player on our team that is, you know, getting more respect than, than we're getting. Uh, it is really just, it's a shame. So uh, we'll see what happens here. We will see what happens here. Uh, hopefully there's some development sooner than later, because if I'm not mistaken, I believe this Mountain West Conference tournament begins late October. Uh, I want to say it's in the final week of, I mean, late November. I think it's in the final week of the month, and it's taking place in Las Vegas. So um, we'll see what happens. Dan Z, I know, is going to remain on top of the story. And uh, Dan, great work so far on all of the uh, uncovering that you've done up to this point. Now, one thing I'll make a mention of before we get into our guest is that one thing we love about President-elect Donald Trump is he is vowing to ban biological men from playing in women's sports. He is wanting to really give credence to why Title IX was created in the first place. So hopefully that is a swift action. We see a very quick turnaround, a reversal as to what we've seen uh, recently in the past as far as trans players playing in women's sports. Uh, not to mention Trump is ready to go back to the good old-fashioned way of just having two genders 
instead of, gosh, at this point, I don't know, hundreds. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Donald Trump. Um, okay, on that note, let's go ahead and bring in today's guest. Uh, she has been on the show a couple times before. Excited to continue this conversation with her, her, plus get into a whole bunch of other things. So let's go ahead and bring in Reagan Charleston. She is a sex abuse and injury attorney. Also, former reality star on Southern Charm, New Orleans. Reagan, how's it going this morning? Good, good. How are you? A lot. A lot I am doing well. Today. We have a lot to talk about. Um, I actually have a fun story for you, but I'm going to wait because let's get into this first story first. Um, I mean, you see what's going on uh, here with the Mountain West Conference, specifically with the San Jose State University women's volleyball team. Uh, they have a trans player on their team. The women have been upset about this all season long. Their feelings have been completely ignored. Uh, a lot more clout has been put into the one trans player's feelings rather than the, the whole team worth of actual female athletes and now you know they're put into a position where they're they're not set up for success in this conference tournament so they're seeking an injunction um as well as the other teams in the conference seeking an injunction because they also haven't been set up for success so how do you see this potentially shaking out there's three options here one sjsu is completely disqualified Two, Blair Fleming, the trans player, is disqualified from competing, or they just reverse the standings according to the forfeitures and take away those wins from San Jose State and, you know, uh, take away the losses from the, the other teams that decided to forfeit. It's tough to say how it's going to go down, but do you have any insight uh, into what could happen based on the information you have at hand? This was just filed yesterday, and so I... I Pulled the um, complaint. It's 132 pages. There's hundreds of pages wow. of exhibits. Um, this is, you know, this implicates some serious issues. I don't think this is going to be cut and dry. I know that plaintiffs in their complaint said that um, they're working on settling right now or negotiating some terms, I guess, prior to the conference beginning. And that if they cannot reach a settlement, they'll move for temporary um, restraining orders and emergency relief from the court. So, I mean, this could go any way, though. Ultimately, it's going to um, be appealed. Any ruling that the court makes, you can expect this to go up because this has tremendous implications for transgender policies <clears throat> in the United States and Title IX. And it's certainly controversial. So I don't expect this to be um, an easy journey in the courts by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, it's 132 pages. Um, I think that just, you know, goes to show, I'm sure there's so many testimonies from so many different women, um, included in this case filing, uh, that really just, uh, give way to how upsetting the situation is. I don't know. Reagan, did you ever play? Were you an athlete uh, growing up or did you um, play? Gymnastics and cheerleading. So not competitive sports okay. like this. Um, but still, I mean, as a woman, I have a daughter and yeah. the thought of having her placed in a situation where she would be competing for opportunities against someone who is biologically superior. I mean, it, it, it's just the facts of nature um, is something that is deeply upsetting to me. And the safety issues. I mean, in 2022, you saw the volleyball player that took a hit to the yes. head and had severe medical issues that resulted from that strike. And it really is something that has to be clarified. This has tremendous implications for not just Title IX, but moving forward is how we are going to protect women in society as a whole. Yeah, I, I think that this is going to, like I said, set a precedent. Now, I don't know exactly because we have a new president coming into office in January. I don't know even if this lawsuit shakes out, you know, in, in a different direction than what we would hope, I don't know how that'll still affect the future moving forward. Because if Trump gets into office and, and vows to ban uh, transgenders from playing in women's sports, and even if this lawsuit is, uh, I guess, has an upsetting outcome, uh, there's still hope for things going back to normal and for women to have the protections that they deserve to move moving forward. But but still, in the meantime, no one wants to see women lose out on opportunities, lose out on successes that they're owed, that they've been working their whole whole life to work towards. Um, so here's to hoping uh, this judge is smart enough to make a wise decision. And uh, there's really only one decision that I think 
should happen that's disqualifying Blair solely from playing in the conference tournament and also then reversing uh, the wins and losses so that the standings look like they should have uh, if these women's First Amendment rights would have been respected in the first place without any uh, fighting at that point in time. Um, okay, Reagan, on the point of Trump being elected into office, uh, he obviously won by a massive landslide. I mean, when you look at a picture of the United States and the parts of the country that went red in this most recent election, I mean, it is a stark difference from what we saw in the 2020 election. I mean, there was, you know, a good mix of blue and red the last time around. This time, it was... It felt like it was all red with like little specks of blue in there and in the places you would expect, right? Uh, New York, a a bigger spot of blue. California got the, you know, coastline of blue. But um, things, especially in middle America, I mean, it is pretty much consistently red for the most part. And it gets you to thinking about all of the different people that switched their vote this time around from Democrat to Republican. And I have a theory And my theory is based on a couple of things, um, which, you know, let's just play a video. And then I have one more recent example. But I believe, Reagan, that the Bidens have become secret Trump supporters. Here's why. (laughs) Guys, I've been doing some thinking, and I'm convinced that the Bidens are Team Trump. First off, we can write it off as a senile Joe mistake from back during, you know, Kamala's failed campaign cycle. But... Remember when Joe Biden put on that MAGA hat and everyone just wrote it off as like an honest mistake? Now that we have more information, I think it was a subtle nod to our now president-elect. Because also his wife is an absolute savage. Jill Biden wearing the blazing red head-to-toe red suit on election day. Ladies, we all know when we put something on, we know how we're going to be perceived. So on election day of all days, to wear a bright red suit, she knew what she was doing. That was another nod to Donald Trump. Last but not least, just yesterday at Arlington National Cemetery for Veterans Day, Kamala Harris walks up. Jill Biden does not even acknowledge her, does not even look up in her direction. And you're telling me that the Bidens don't love Trump? Come on. Okay, so three examples right there, right? Three things right there. And then most recently, Reagan, yesterday, when we had our first meeting, go down between Trump and Biden at the White House. They were sitting in front of that beautiful fireplace, which I will say was going off like crazy. Like, I've never seen such a massive fire in a fireplace. Um, Look at that. It's like the most intense fire in the world. Uh, You saw an interaction between them. And that was, you know, Joe Biden saying, welcome back. But he said it with such a big, I mean, this isn't the right photo for it, but he had this big smile on his face. And it felt like he just had, there we, there we go, that's a perfect picture. Look at this. Jo, have you seen Joe this happy in a long time? He had this smile almost plastered to his face uh, the entire time this meeting was taking place. I don't know. Listen, the, the only difference between a conspiracy theory, in fact, is a couple of months, Reagan. I am convinced, based on the evidence in the past and now that we've just seen uh, taking place over the course of this week, I've got to believe that the Bidens are Team Trump. Weigh in. What do you think? I mean, can you blame them? I mean, they're humans. I mean, humans. No, I can't blame them. Joe Biden is ice cold, ice cold. I mean, brave, bold. Um, I loved the red suit. And I just, you know, she's. It's um, it's funny to see, but I mean, come on, after what what he went through and stepping down, can you really I mean, he's a human. Can you really blame him? No, not at all. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. Well, especially because and listen, I don't think she did such a fantastic job at doing so, but. Kamala was getting a lot of fingers pointed at her throughout her campaign and saying, well, you know, if you believe in all of these things that you're talking about, why aren't you doing them right now? You're in office. You know, you talk about turning the page, but if you're currently in office, why should we need to turn the page if you're such a fantastic leader? So then when Kamala was hearing all of this critical feedback, she started trying to distance herself a little bit more. You know, it felt like more and more as time went on. And I'm sure Joe Biden was like, excuse you, you would not be in this position if it wasn't for me. And he's probably thinking to himself, oh, my God, I, I, 
I didn't even want to pick this woman. I was convinced to choose her because she was a black woman. I was told that it was going to help me to get a bunch more votes, which, you know, it inevitably probably did in some form or fashion. And he was just probably like, nope, not happening. I know who my vote's going to. Jill, darling, the red suit it is. Oh, 100 um, <laughs> percent. Absolutely. That you can see that from a mile away. I mean, the, the red suit was a choice. <laughs> She, she woke up yes. <laughs> that morning and chose violence. She was like, I am going to wear my exactly. brightest red suit <laughs> to send the clearest message. And then, you know, Veterans Day. Wow. I mean, she didn't even so much as look in her direction. But I mean, it, it was yeah. legacy, you know, I mean, it's um, it's not surprising at all, but not even a nod. It's Jill's a beast. Yeah. I mean, Reagan. You know, come on. I mean, you were in the reality TV show world for a bit. And I feel like in that world, they especially like they want you to play more into all of these like these moments of drama. And when someone walks into a room. And you don't acknowledge them and you like make it a point, not even just to like not, but just to not even like to stare straight ahead. Come on. I mean, that is intentional. The, that is the ultimate shutdown, like the ultimate dig. It's not even looking at them and like giving kind of like a curt hello. Ignoring somebody is the best way just to show you do not care and you don't want anything to do with them. She was laser focused in the other direction. She didn't so much as like glance over. <laughs> I mean, the message is very clear. And then, you know, as to the fireplace scene, it looked like a Christmas card. And <laughs> it's just uh, it's such a juxtaposition. But, you know, here we are. Here we are. Um, you know, while we're on, I just want to tell a quick story. While we're on the subject of reality TV, I had a fun story last night, Reagan. Um, and this is, you know, it's a, it involves one of your Bravo counterparts, I was buying something off of Facebook Marketplace. Have you ever bought anything off Facebook Marketplace? Oh, absolutely. I buy all of my plants on Facebook Marketplace from the little old ladies in my neighborhood. I love it. <laughs> oh, it's so cute. Okay, so I was, I, I was, I'm looking for artwork for the apartment, and I came across this piece of art that is gorgeous. Um, it actually, it's something that's even still being sold on Neiman Marcus's website for $7,500. And it was marked down on Facebook to far less than that. And so I'm looking at it like, wait a second, you know, this, you know, because you never know on Facebook. There's a lot of counterfeit stuff on Facebook. And then I reached out to the person whose profile it was, and I offered them even less than what they had it listed for. Because I'm like, whatever, if you, you don't take a shot, you'll never get hit, right? Shoot your shot. And she, immediately the person gets back and they're like, yeah, that's fine. And I'm like, oh, that was really fast. Like are you a catfish? Like, I'm not sure what's happening. So I, I'm moving forward. Hey, I need to come see the piece before I buy it, whatever. So last night I go to this person's house. I bring someone with me because I just want to ensure that, you know, nice. I'm not walking into the lion's den, who knows? And I pull up to this, you know, it's in New York. There's a lot of buildings from the outside. You can't really tell what it's going to look like inside, but it's, it looked to be a, pre, you know, a presentable enough building. So I'm like, okay, check. We're good so far. Get inside the building, looking like a clean building. But again, you don't know what you're getting into. Walk into this apartment. A woman comes to the door. I walk into this apartment. It is beautiful. It is stunning. I'm like, what is going on here? Like, I was not expecting this apartment. I get in. The artwork is exactly what it was meant to be. It's I'm, I'm just, you know, it was a situation where they just wanted to get rid of it. That's why it was a fire sale. Um, turns out this person shared with me, I don't want to say their name on the program, but they shared with me that um, they were a part of the New, New York, uh, the Real Housewives of New York City franchise. No, and I like was like, OG franchise? Um, no. Okay, I would you're say gonna like have more, to tell me who later. I, I'm going to tell you offline. I'm going to tell you offline. Um, but I was like, oh, my gosh, this is so cool. I just it's like one of those fun stories, like only would happen in New York type of stories oh, 100%. Um, that I wind up in this gorgeous apartment belonging to a celebrity. And um, it's cool. I mean, there's your, your little Bravo connection. Anyways, 
I, I will DM you after the show and I'll tell you who yeah, it was. Yeah, I want to see it. Um, that's, um, that's lovely. Yeah, we don't yeah. have uh, stories like that in New Orleans on Facebook Marketplace. <laughs> Not at all. You get to go to your little old ladies' hot homes and get the yes. plants. Yes, those are your stories. Um, okay, let's let's get back to the campaign that was beautifully, beautifully executed by Donald Trump. One of the things we loved about Donald Trump's campaigns was he just kept it real, right? He wasn't looking for the glitz and the glamour. Like things were kept very traditionally. Now, obviously, things evolve over time, right? Certain people get involved that have more of a pulse on what people want on the pop culture scene, that type of thing. And those people certainly jumped into Donald Trump's campaign, but it was done in the most organic sense. They were people that were there because they believe in what Donald Trump was putting forward for our country. They believed in his platform and his policies. So, for example, you know, we saw Elon Musk get on board. Uh, we saw Joe Rogan at the very last moment get on board. Uh, but we also saw several athletes over the course of his campaign get on board, one of those being Danica Patrick, who is uh, phenomenal in her own right. And she actually had something very funny and interesting to say. Uh, she revealed her salary because sometimes... Jumping into a campaign isn't without, you know, some type of a little bit of a kickback. Um, I don't know how often that happens or did happen, if at all, on Donald Trump's campaign. Uh, we certainly know what happened a bunch on, on Kamala's side, which we'll get to in a second. But Danica wanted to jump in and reveal her salary on X. And here's what she said. Quote, all the events, rallies, interviews, social posts I did for free. Actually spent a fair amount on wardrobe. But to be fair... <laughs> I can't twerk, so it all adds up, <laughs> which is hilarious because she did this on top of, you know, one of the celebs that decided to endorse Kamala Harris, which is Megan Thee Stallion and, you know, her little posse of backup dancers. And listen, Megan Thee Stallion is ultra talented, but when you go to a political rally, you aren't there to like have like, you know... <laughs> parental advisory rap songs being played <laughs> and like tons of twerking taking place. And that is actually what we saw consistently at Kamala Harris's rallies. Uh, on that note, uh, in stark contrast to Danica Patrick, just doing it for free because she wanted to be there because she believed in Donald Trump because she wholeheartedly just wanted him to win. Kamala Harris, she spent six figures on building the set for her Call Her Daddy podcast appearance, which, by the way, I don't believe, last I checked, even hit a million views, uh, which is very low for the Call Her Daddy podcast. That's like, I think, I want to say it's in the top either three or five podcasts in the world. So very, very low uh, viewership for that uh, that specific episode. Uh, Kamala spent $3.9 million dollars on a social media marketing agency. She also paid $1 million to Oprah Winfrey's Harpo Productions. Uh, we, we saw Oprah um, several different times uh, over the course of the campaign, so that would make sense. Uh, rumor has it Kamala Harris spent a billion dollars on her campaign. A lot of this on celebrity endorsements. Uh, I mean, when you look at the difference, I mean, it just goes to show how unorganic the Kamala Harris was, how manufactured, the hype was all manufactured from the beginning. They just thought if they threw some money at some celebrities, at some notable figures, some influencers, voters wouldn't feel compelled to do any of their own research. Instead, they would just say, you know what, because we saw a concert at one of the rallies, I'm in. Uh, I really think that that's kind of a bit of an insult to voters, uh, to think that they would be just so naive to go in the direction of the Democrats solely based on, you know, them being swayed by superficiality, like aspects such as this. It's out of touch. And I think that that's what you're seeing with someone like Danica Patrick, that it's an authentic relationship. She is there for genuine reasons. She believes in the message that she's delivering. And, you know, having all of these celebrity endorsements that are paid and you're, I don't know, you know, exactly what you're promoting. And I love Megan the Sally and she's great. But like you said, is it really the appropriate place at a political rally, a presidential political rally? Um, it's, it's just, it's strange to me, but I think that the American, obviously the American people saw through that, but it's, it's, you know, um, 
they're drinking their the Kool-Aid. They're high on their own supply. Like it's this out of touch idea that these celebrity endorsements are somehow, like you said, going to influence the American people. But it had the opposite effect and it turned people off and pushed people away because it is so inauthentic and it doesn't feel genuine. Um, it's It was awkward for me personally. I found some of it cringy. I yeah. don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was certainly it was certainly awkward because when you watch the video, I mean, when you know these rallies were taking place and then it would so circulating social media after the fact. I mean, like you said, out of touch is a great way to put it, because they had these concerts thinking, I don't know what they thought, like the rally hall was just going to turn into like one big like people just going crazy, like dancing. I don't know if they thought like there was going to be some like grinding in the stands <laughs> like you would see at normal concerts, like people with their phones out. It was like you just saw people in the background because this wasn't a, in a lot of cases that the typical audience for Megan Thee Stallion, which is fine. You can still appreciate good talent, but. I mean, some people were just standing there like, what is going on? Like, it was. It was awkward. Um, they certainly didn't get the reaction that they thought they were going to. And and not just within within those four walls when the rallies were taking place, but even outside of them. I think people were like, what the hell is this? Well, we've been saying, and I, we had this conversation before, like, why do people care what George Clooney has to say or Beyonce or Taylor Swift? And, you know, I think they think, oh, they're selling out arenas that, you know, certainly they must have this great influence on the you know, American population. And it's just not reality. It's just, it's being out of touch and um, really just, I don't know, like the, the cringe factor for me. I just keep going back to that. Like, <laughs> you just don't expect this at a political event. Like, where's the decorum um, and the seriousness of all of this? But it, it Where's the decency, fired. right? Wasn't decency wasn't decency supposed to be on the ballot for the Democrats? I I just like formalities and I like decorum and I like seriousness and I just don't find that with like an all out concert. I I and you know it is what it is. But to find out it was paid too, that's the shocking thing for yeah. me because Hollywood comes in mass, right? It, like they're all supporting and. Um, pro-Democrat, and you'd think that they would show up out of the kindness of their hearts, right, and donate their time and efforts, but no, they're getting a check. If they believe uh, in the cause, for sure. No, got to get the check. It's, it's, um, yep. it's counterintuitive. Well, certainly out of touch um, is something many people, the reason why they ended up voting for Donald Trump is because of the elitist policies and, and, and just the, the lack of understanding what the everyday person is suffering uh, these days in this country. And hopefully those will turn around rather quickly. But the economy was probably the biggest factor in which people hinged their vote on this time around. Uh, people can barely afford their grocery bills. They can't afford to fill up their cars. Uh, they can't afford to to make payments on on a house if that's the direction that you know they would hopefully go in. I mean, that's part of the American dream: being able to afford a, buying a home at some point during your lifetime. Uh, but if you need to have more evidence that the economy is truly suffering, look no further than Saks Fifth Avenue, Reagan. One of the longstanding traditions over the holiday season in New York City is Saks puts on this tremendous light show. And yes, it is very expensive, but we're talking about Saks Fifth Avenue, right? Probably the most notable department store in the entire world, right? If anybody has the money to put on their annual light show, it should be Saks, right? Uh, not so fast, because in fact, even this year, they're celebrating their centennial anniversary. This would be the storefront's 100th anniversary, but they're making some changes. They actually have said that the light show will not happen this year due to, quote, what they're calling changes in its approach to the holiday windows for this flagship milestone anniversary. But Reagan, we're all smart enough to realize that on an anniversary like this, the centennial, during the holiday season, you don't just suddenly change your approach, right? We have gotten to the point where Saks can't even Saks anymore, right? It is certainly, I would speculate with, without any doubt at all, that this is due to the economy. And I understand it. It's sad. It's sad when you see traditions die. 
But if even someone like Sachs can pinch pennies where they can, and pennies is an understatement in this case, probably more like hundreds of thousands of dollars, they're going to do it. They probably saw a massive decline in spending over the course of this past, I don't know how long, maybe a year or so. And they probably found at this point in time they should save some money. So just, you know, more testament. I feel like as a woman, you know, you understand the... Well, yeah. I mean, when our luxury retailers what this means. are, yeah, well, our luxury retailers are cutting corners at the holidays when, you know, it should, you should be pulling out all the stops, especially celebrating a centennial like this. Um, I'm a small business owner and I own a store in New Orleans and it's been, it's been very difficult. I talked to all of the business owners in my community. We're all facing similar challenges and our customers aren't buying. I mean, they just don't have the expendable cash to go out and buy, you know, jewelry or shoes or whatever it may be. And, it, you know, to know that it's hitting major companies and businesses like Saks, it's telling, um, you know, it's, it's sad, but hopefully, um, you know, there's some good news on the horizon. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, I think there will be. I think there will be. Uh, we remain optimistic. Um, okay, Reagan, I have to let you go now, but expect a DM from me in a couple of minutes because I've got yeah, some, I can't wait to some juicy out. gossip for you. <laughs> Love it. Bye. See you later, Reagan. All right, for our final story, let's stick with one that deals with the economy. And this is just such a good one. The women of The View, oh, how they try. They try so hard. They try so hard to make sense. That's one thing. Uh, they also try so hard to be relatable. Often they fail at both of those things. But still, we love to, you know, we, we can't help it to indulge in the statements that they make on a daily basis. This one coming from Whoopi Goldberg. Uh, she is now whining about the fact that she still has to work because of this economy. Listen to what she said just this week on The View. I, I, I appreciate that people are having a hard time. Me too. Yeah. I work for a living. If I had all the money in the world, I would not be here. <laughs> <laughs> okay? So I'm a working person, you know? And my kid has to feed her family. You know, and my great granddaughter has to be fed by her family. I know it's hard out there. <laughs> what are you talking about? You have no idea how hard it is out anywhere. You have zero idea. Why? Because, yes, you're working, but how much money are you making, Whoopi? Are, are you really feeling the pinch that so many Americans are? Because according to reports, the co-hosts on The View receive salaries ranging from one to eight million dollars per year. And I am going to go out and probably assume that Whoopi Goldberg is not at the low end of that range, making one million dollars a year. So you're making two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight million dollars a year. Who knows? And you're complaining about having to work when your job is, listen, while I will say that the view is complete BS most times, like based on the things that they're saying is what, what I mean. You have an awesome job. I mean, if the view were to hire a panel of very smart, you know, understanding women who had thoughtful conversations, that show could be incredible. I mean, the premise of that show is incredible. Uh, you just don't have the right people <laughs> on that show. But you have an awesome job. I mean, yes, I would. If, if if the show decided to go in a different direction, I would. I would be a host on The View. Why not? That's an incredible job. You have an incredible opportunity. You have massive influence. You have the ability to have a platform to spread information to to teach people valuable lessons. Uh, you, you shouldn't be complaining at all, even if you did have money, because there's a lot of people that work in TV that have a ton of money that would never need to work another day in their life, but they choose to because they love what they do and they have a tremendous opportunity. So that's one, but also B, you have no idea what people are going through, right? You're, if you really wanted to retire with the money that you have in your account, you probably could. Could you 
indulge in all of the luxuries for the rest of your life that you wanted to. I mean, maybe if you invest wisely. Uh, but yeah, you could probably pull back a little bit and be just fine. Probably still off way better than 99% of the people in this country. So just another rich statement coming from a woman on The View. We're used to it. Uh, probably have another one coming your way tomorrow, if you're lucky. Everybody, that is going to do it for this show. Thank you so much for being here. If you're not already, shame on you, but you should be following me on social media at Charlie on TV. That is going to do it for Thursday. We have got our final show of the week on deck for tomorrow. I'll see you then. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. As you know, the woke sports media is in shambles and OutKick is on top. So make sure you're tuning into my show, OutKick the Morning, for your fill of sports, pop culture, politics, and everything in between. For more original content, make sure you're clicking here. And also make sure you're subscribing by clicking here. Everybody, thanks for watching. Catch more later.